What better way to start an annotated PowerPoint than with a quiz? So where would you find a map? Whether it be in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, in the sarcomere, on the sarcolemma, on the troponin tropomycin complex, or in the glove compartment? Have to think back, what does MAP stand for? And yeah, that's the muscle action potential, and it's on the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane of a muscle cell or muscle fiber. Remember, it's going to run down the membrane, then go down the T-tubules, then run alongside the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where it will open the calcium channel garage doors and let the calcium out. We've been talking about the neuromuscular junction. I think one way to get an idea of how it works is to see what kinds of things make it not work. So let's talk about acetylcholinesterase and nerve gas. So acetylcholinesterase breaks down 5,000 to 60,000 molecules of acetylcholine per second. It's one of the most efficient enzymes in the human body. So remember, the moment acetylcholine gets released from the vesicles of the synaptic knob, or terminal bouton, um, acetylcholinesterase starts breaking them down because you only want muscle contraction to last a very short amount of time. That's the way we can control, you know, exactly our, our muscles exactly. So acetylcholinesterase is just tearing these acetylcholines apart. <clears throat> Most nerve gases inhibit acetylcholinesterase. Now think this through. Just stop and think about it for a moment. So you've got a bunch of acetylcholine in the synapse, in the synaptic cleft. It's out there ready to bind to receptors. Remember, it can bind to a receptor. It'll open the ion channel and let the sodium through. And then the receptor lets go of it again right away. And then it'll float around and then it can bind to the receptor again. It can bind to the receptor over and over and over and over again. So once you release acetylcholine, the muscle is going to contract forever unless you've got some way to get that acetylcholine out of there. So acetylcholinesterase is what gets it out of there. It tears it in half, chops it up, rips it apart into a choline and into an acetic acid, which can then be recycled and reused. So what if you prevent acetylcholinesterase from working? It means you're going to have a ton of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft and therefore the muscle is gonna just keep contracting and contracting and contracting all right and so yeah continues to bind receptors the muscle continues to contract and what's that gonna do it's gonna cause all of your muscles to try to contract simultaneously we call that spastic paralysis think about it if your flexors and your ex and your extensors are trying to contract simultaneously then you know like in your arm then your arm can't either flex or extend because the two muscles are working against one another. So you become kind of frozen and that's spastic paralysis. You can't move. Causes lots of other uh, effects with the autonomic nervous system which we'll talk about later. But Nerve gas was used in World War I and it was such a horrible thing that all the countries of the world got together and signed an agreement saying they would never do that again. But of course, you know, countries Plus, there were a lot of countries that didn't exist after World War I that came into existence, existence later. But nerve gas continues to be used. The Soviets used it in Afghanistan. Um, Saddam Hussein used it in Iraq against the Kurds. Um, terrorists used it in an attack in the subway in Tokyo. So nerve gas, powerful stuff, um, goes to work immediately. <clears throat> so the cobra and the postsynaptic junction. So we were... First, we saw the toxin, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like nerve gas that work out in the synaptic cleft. How about something that works at the neuromuscular junction <clears throat> itself on one side or the other? So, venom from cobras contains a toxin called cobra toxin. Cobra toxin blocks postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors so that no neurotransmitter can bind. So, in this case, there's acetylcholine out there in the synapse and there's plenty of it and it's wanting the muscle to contract but the toxin from the cobra blocks the receptor so that the acetylcholine can't attach to the receptor it can't bind to the receptor so what's going to happen there's not going to be any muscle contraction at all okay no action potentials are generated in the neuromuscular junction no muscle action potentials and so what happens you can't move that's flaccid paralysis okay do you see how that works in this case no muscle contraction. And the picture there just shows what happens when you do a Google image search for cobra. You get a bunch of dumbasses in the lower left-hand corner 
You got St uh, Sly Stallone, who made a movie called Cobra. You got the Shelby Cobra in the upper right there, a neat car. Um, and then lots of other Cobras. Oh, a singing group named Cobra there on the right. Um, I think in the upper left, that's one of the South African Cobras. And then you can see the uh, spectacled Cobra in the lower right, and the monocled Cobra in the upper right. And then um, the genus of Cobra, you know, so everything, uh, all living things have scientific names. Cobras are nausea, so I, I googled nausea, and I got that woman in the very middle from a Danish uh, we uh, dating site. She uh, She's looking for a date, so give her a call if you're interested. Let's look at botulinum toxin. So botulinum toxin produced by Clostridium botulinum, a gram-positive anaerobic spore-forming rod bacterium. If you take a micro, you'll know what that means. Botulinum toxin, uh, remember, we can uh, it's, it's diluted and then sold as Botox, <coughs> which people use to remove wrinkles and things like that. It has legitimate clinical uses even without the cosmetic ones so sometimes people with migraines get injections of Botox into their splenius capitis muscles which are the ones that hold up the head and that um, reduces tension. Um, I read about a violinist who had a, a muscle twitch in his arm so they gave him very small injections of <clears throat> Botox and that helped take the twitch away. But Botox is just diluted botulinum toxin. Botulinum toxin is the deadliest substance known on the planet. It has the lowest LD50, lethal dose for 50% of the population. That's how you measure the toxicity of things. Botulinum toxin has the lowest LD50 of anything known. So this is the most potent toxin known on the entire planet. And it's just for Botox, you dilute it very, very highly. And then um, it has only small effects. So what happens here with botulinum toxin is it's sucked in by the axon terminal where it prevents exocytosis, the release of neurotransmitter. So Botox is a presynaptic toxin. It works on the release of the acetylcholine, whereas cobra toxin we just looked at was a postsynaptic toxin. See, we're talking about which side of the synaptic cleft the toxin works on. Cobra toxin worked on the postsynaptic side by blocking the receptors. Modulinum toxin works on the presynaptic side by preventing the release of neurotransmitter. So what's going to happen in this case? You're not going to get any neurotransmitter release, therefore, once again, you're going to get flaccid paralysis. There's no muscle contraction. Um, occasional outbreaks of botulism food poisoning kill dozens of people. So people that do the home canning, um, notice the first thing we said is a anaerobic bacterium. That means it only lives where there's no oxygen. But, you know, there's botulinum, there's clostridium botulinum all over the place. And sometimes people who do home canning, you got to follow the instructions very carefully. you got to heat that stuff up to kill the bacteria. If you don't, then bacteria can be in your home canned stuff. And once you screw the lid on and make it airtight, now those bacteria really start to proliferate. So um, treatment involves, if you're poisoned by botulinum toxin, um, mechanical respiration. In other words, they put you on a ventilator to breathe for you. Death occurs in over 70% of untreated uh, cases. And like I was saying, highly diluted botulinum toxin has become popular as a facial injection to reduce and prevent wrinkles. In the lower right there, you can see they're gonna take away some crow's feet there <coughs> with a little injection. Um, I guess what I read is that the home canned green beans, for whatever reason, turn out to be some of the most popular ones, um, common ones that you find the bo uh, botulinum toxin in. And again, it's called botulism. Uh, happens a lot like church potlucks. So everybody goes to the church potluck, potluck and they share their home canned green beans and then they all die. But I guess since they're all at a church potluck, they're all going to heaven, so it's okay. And in the upper left, why do I have a picture of that little baby? Because you can't make a face like that if you've got Botox injections. Um, can't do that. All right, the Taipan. The inland Taipan has the lowest LD50 of any snake. So it is. That guy in the upper right, you may remember him, Steve Rubin. According to him, uh, the Inland Time Pan was the deadliest snake in the world. Um, he was a great uh, character. Died when a stingray um, pierced his heart. Um, which, what the heck, if you're a biologist, that's the way you ought to go, by gully. So, um, the taipan found in Australia and New Guinea has typoxin, which attacks the presynaptic membrane. So, once again, we're back to, uh, well, it's a presynaptic toxin. 
And um, it's also known as a phospholipase A2 toxin, a PLA2 toxin, because it acts as an enzyme that breaks down the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane at position A2. So the phospholipid bilayer, remember, is the, it makes the membrane that goes around all of your cells. Well, those phospholipid molecules are bound together at various places. There are various chemical bonds. And they're labeled A1, A2, and then I think C and D. Um, there, there was a B at one point, but they discovered that B was actually just a different form of A, and so that's why they called B, they switched the name to A2. You don't have to know all that detail. But um, the bottom line is this toxin actually attacks the cell membrane. So what does it do? It starts to dissolve the membrane around your cell. Well, so the synaptic end bulb, the synaptic knob, has a cell membrane, right? And so what happens is this toxin, if you're bitten by a taipan, um, it's going to eat away the end of the synaptic bulb. Now, when that first happens, it prevents the release of neurotransmitter. So initially, you get a flaccid paralysis. Then, as it eats through the end of the synaptic knob, the toxin then eats through the vesicle membranes, and then suddenly all the neurotransmitter is dumped into the synapse at once. So you then briefly get a spastic paralysis, but then, as the acetylcholinesterase degrades all the acetylcholine, you don't have any more in reserve because you dumped all you had into the synapse. And so that follows up then with another phase of flaccid paralysis. So they call it the triphasic response because you go flaccid, then spastic, then flaccid. That's very cool. So if you're ever bitten now by a taipan and you're dying, you'll know exactly what's happening. When you first start to lose muscle control, you go, okay, yeah, it's eating away those phospholipid bilayers. And then as you go spastic, you'll be able to think, yeah, now all my neurotransmitters are getting dumped into the synapse. And then as you go flaccid again, you're going to be thinking, yeah, all that acetylcholinesterase is gobbling up all that acetylcholine. It'll be very cool. You'll know exactly what's happening as you die. So let's move on. We need to start talking about the energy for muscle contraction and how muscles generate different amounts of force. So <clears throat> remember ATP is the energy currency of the human body, adenosine triphosphate. I don't want that to be a mysterious thing for you in case in Bio 156 they didn't go into this in sufficient detail. So on the left there you see a molecule of adenosine and then on the right a triphosphate. So each one of those, see the P's? Those are phosphates. A PO4 is a molecule of phosphate. And phosphate bonds are also are often called high energy bonds. There's a lot of energy in that connection there, in that chemical bond between the oxygen and the phosphate. So when you break that, it releases energy. And that's what powers the reactions of your body. That's how the, all the things in your body get the energy they need in order to do the stuff they need to do. Well, what happens is, look at the top, you've got a molecule of ATP. <clears throat> when you break off a phosphate in the lower right there, you get 7.3 kilocalories per mole. Um, but now you, and that's the energy you need to power reactions in your body. But now you've got ADP, adenosine diphosphate. It's lost a phosphate. That's sometimes called the uncharged form. So what you have to do is you have to eat food, and then you'll get more phosphates, and then you can use, um, you can stick a phosphate back onto an ADP and then you make another ATP. So look at how that's constantly going back and forth in your body, those, those pink arrows there. That's constantly what's happening inside of you. You take an ATP, you release the phosphate, you gain energy from it, and then you have to use energy to put a new phosphate back on and you constantly cycle through those. That's essentially why you have to keep eating food in order to get that energy then the energy, you use that to make ATP, then ATP powers the reactions inside your body, and then round and round and round we go. ATP is not the only molecule that does things like that. There's also phosphoenolpyruvate, 1,3-diphosphoglycerate, sometimes called bisphosphoglycerate, phosphocreatine, which we're going to talk about, ATP, and then glucose 1-phosphate. Just showing you, though, all, notice they all have phosphate bonds. Those are the high energy bonds and that's what makes things happen inside of your body. So we'll talk more about this in the next PowerPoint. <coughs>